Yeah. Just, just a, a brief informal introduction back here, just to see how delighted we are to welcome Jack Lum, who is an old friend of EPIC and a long standing supporter of um, the Institute for Global Leadership as well, and uh, is a well respected Washington lawyer, um, an expert on uh, white collar crime and a really, really advocate for those uh, victims of financial fraud. Um, Jack spent many years uh, working with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, and guiding them in that important issue. He's also uh, served as a consultant for the UN and UN agencies. So he brings a wealth of experience uh, today and we're very looking forward very much to what he has to say about this really pressing issue now about offshore financing and tackling that as the uh, major solution to inequality. So welcome. We're delighted to have you with us. I'm delighted to be back here on the Touch campus. Taking on some of these topics, which are, I believe, some of the most important topics that we can be dealing with. Before I really talk about uh, corruption, there's something I want to get out there to all of the students who are listening and the people who have concerns with these issues. And that is the primary responsibility of all of us should be to accept reality, to look and hear and accept what we see and we hear, and then think about it. Uh, we're in a world where virtual reality, virtual whatever, uh, people constructing alternative truth or alternative facts, become so much ignored that we sort of accept that this is where the world is going. Uh, the notion of metaverse horrifies me. What I want to see is reality verse. I want to see people looking at the world as it is and thinking about it as it is. Now, thinking about it as it is brings several issues right to the fore. And in thinking about the issue of corruption and inequality, and the heart of the matter uh, it really is responsibility to the society and the larger global society. Uh, in virtually every culture, there's a coming of age uh, ceremony, uh, churches have confirmations, synagogues have bar mitzvahs, uh, tribal societies around the world have various rights to bring people into the group and get people to be concerned about the group. Uh, there comes out of that real sense of social responsibility, a responsibility to the group and an understanding that if you do something that is against the common good, you stand to be made an outcast, you stand to be uh, penalized one way or another, but certainly it's clearly understood you've done something wrong. Unfortunately, we have developed a world in which one group of people, people who have resources and money, have had the capacity to move into another world where there is no responsibility to anybody, only the responsibility, it seems, to make money or to develop a life and a lifestyle that removes you from the everyday concerns of other people or the everyday problems of other people. So uh, what we've seen is stuff like the real estate page of the Friday Wall Street Journal which will have all of the houses for sale, ranging from $20 million to $100 million to $150 million. How many acres would you like? Would you like to buy a whole town? And uh, 
uh, with that a kind of otherworldly level of money and power that uh, really puts people outside of the reach of uh, normal life. They just don't experience life the same way. But even more important than the question of not experiencing life the same way is the very systematic ability to remove one's assets and one's uh, legal responsibilities outside of the reach of courts, outside of the reach of police, outside of the reach of uh, the normal things that keep people within bounds in a society. And uh, this has been a world of offshore. That is to say, I can put my money somewhere where you can't find it, where nobody can sue me and actually get it. And uh, if I behave badly, uh, it won't matter because nobody can do anything to me as a result. So uh, just to note, uh, a perfect example is Bhopal, India, where a long time ago, and most people don't even remember how long ago it was, uh, a factory, Union Carbide Factory, released toxic chemicals and thousands of people were injured, killed. It was a mess. Uh, there was litigation. There was no question of the culpability of Union Carbide. There are still victims in Bhopal waiting for compensation because through a series of structures particularly subsidiary corporations, uh, all of this has gotten lost. There's nobody to go after. There's nobody who has responsibility. Responsibility is put in a corporation that is a subsidiary, but after all, you can't go from the subsidiary to the parent. And the question is, why do we allow that kind of structuring? Uh, a question I ask time and again is why should a corporation have a hundred subsidiaries or more, which is a routine kind of thing in the corporate world. Uh, you say to yourself, uh, okay, there may be some kinds of reasons, but principally it's a break in any form of responsibility. Now, this is also true in the area of taxation. Taxation is something that is the most essential way a society has of paying for the common goods, the things that we all need to survive. And uh, if you begin to break up the corporate structure in a way that moves pieces all over the place and there are always separate subsidiaries and the tax returns are incomprehensible as a consequence, uh, there is no real responsibility on the part of the corporation. And to make that tangible, I'll give you an example of a friend of mine who owned a weekly newspaper in San Francisco. And he was put upon in a competitive situation where another newspaper chain tried to put him out of business. He won a $20 million judgment, final decree in the California state courts. He then went to collect on this judgment. And it turned out the people he went against uh, had done a variety of things to structure their affairs so that there was nothing that could be done to collect the judgment. They had a string of subsidiary, sorry, pardon me, subsidiary corporations. They had moved assets uh, far and wide. But more important, the assets that were within reach were mortgaged to the hill. And as a result, the mortgage had uh, primary claim on the very assets that could have been this judgment. Now, he wound up with a $20 million judgment being forced to settle for about $2.5 million, which uh, is really not uh, justice as justice was intended to be. Now, there is, believe it or not, a section of the American Bar Association 
of which I'm ashamed to say I'm a member, uh, that it specializes in what they call asset protection, which is to say, how do I keep assets from winding up in the hands of somebody I've injured? I find that to be completely inconsistent with the oath that every attorney is supposed to take when they become a member of the bar, which is an oath to help uphold the law and to uphold and enforce you're an officer of the court, the judgments of the court. This is a, a section that's devoted to the reverse. So there are people who very consciously use this kind of structuring to make sure that they don't have a responsibility to the society they're in. And this is civil. It goes to matters, let's say, matrimonial matters. A wealthy guy wants to dump a wife and uh, not pay for it. it. The money goes offshore. Now, to talk for a minute about the offshore structures takes us into this world of uh, secrecy and havens. And we're talking now about countries that lend their legal systems and their sovereignty to people who simply want to opt out of the responsibilities of their own society. Uh, that it turns out is something that is remarkable in its own right. The secrecy laws of many of these jurisdictions were written by lawyers in New York, the, or lawyers in London. The British are at the center of an awful lot of this offshore stuff. And each time they take what appears to be a step forward to controlling it, it turns out it's a step backwards. So, for example, they have a company's house in the UK, and the parliament passed a law that said we really have to have a disclosure system to find out who the beneficial ownership of corporations registered in the UK, who is the beneficial owner. And at last count, according to last week's uh, Guardian newspaper, there were some 230,000 corporations that were still completely anonymous despite the law because nothing had been done to enforce. And then there are the structures that allow one corporation to be owned by another corporation, but not only that, to have as its directors other corporations to have officers who are other corporations. And you say, well, where's the responsibility for anything? Mm -hmm. uh, in theory, in corporate law, the board of directors has uh, a responsibility to manage the corporation and manage its affairs for the benefit of shareholders. And that means directors are supposed to be looking at what the corporation does and make sure that it's appropriate and vote and decide, is this an okay thing for the management of the company to be doing? In case after case after case, nothing like that occurs. What happens is a corporation is set up. It has corporate directors who are other corporations. It has corporate managers who are other corporations. There are no records in the country where the, the corporation is incorporated other than the certificate of incorporation. So if you go there, there's no there then. And nobody to go after, nobody to change. Uh, that lack of any kind of managerial responsibility for what a corporation does says to me it's not really a corporation. But for reasons I have yet to have explained to me, when you bring up the subject of, well, we should be saying, as let's say the United States, that we will not recognize a corporation as real if it comes from a jurisdiction that doesn't require genuine participation, board decision-making and the like, people are recoiling horror. You're gonna undermine the financial system. Well, this is a system that I believe should be undermined because that notion of responsibility 
is key to uh, having any sense of social justice or key to making corporations behave properly. If everybody believes that we can get away with it and nothing's going to happen, uh, it's clear to me that everything bad will happen and people will behave badly. <clears throat> the essence of all criminal law enforcement is deterrence. That is, somebody has to get punished for other people to see that happen and other people to come to the belief that maybe it won't be a good idea to do this bad thing. We have a system where corporations can pretty well do anything beyond by anybody and there's no penalty for it. Deterrence is shot and everything is fair game. That should not be the way the affairs of the world are managed. And then there's the question of how do we know that what I'm saying is the reality of how the world is working? Well, we've had a series of disclosures, and I'm now talking about really major disclosures of bad behavior by financial institutions, by individual corporations, and by individuals that should put us on notice that this is very serious stuff. Uh, let's go back to one of the first big disclosures. A client of mine, a man named Heinrich Kieber, uh, took the bank records of LGT Bank in Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein is a country that's a geographic accident, but has a population of about 35,000 people that's tucked into the side of a mountain in uh, Austria. Uh, hard to get to, but boy, a lot of money finds its way there because its specialty is setting up uh, shell companies, trusts, and the like, so that nobody can track the money and certainly nobody can collect tax. What he had were all the trust company records. And what the trust company records showed was that wealthy individuals and families had set up trusts. The trusts in turn owned corporations. And the upshot of all of that was that the money was pretty well untraceable and untaxed. Uh, all of that was laid out in Senate hearings. Everybody said, oh my God, we've got to do things. It turned out that yes, uh, here and there, as a result, governments collected quite a bit of tax money. In fact, off his disclosures, my understanding is roughly four and a half billion dollars in otherwise lost tax money was collected. The biggest collections came from German citizens who found Liechtenstein to be very convenient. It's uh, very close to the Bodensee and, and very in a very favorable geographical position if you want to drive there and set something up to cheat. And there were characters in Liechtenstein who had come to attention previously. Uh, there was one lawyer, uh, Dr. Dr. I'll remember his name in a minute, who uh, was a trustee of all these different trusts and uh, was the expert, Dr. Dr. Botliner. Uh, he was the expert in setting up trusts that would conceal your wealth and allow you to go on without paying taxes and avoid estate taxes if you die. The problem was a lot of really stupid people went to Botliner, set up these trusts, and, and they worked as long as the person was alive. But when the person died, his heirs didn't know that there was a trust in Liechtenstein. And of course, who then was the beneficiary? Dr. Botliner. Uh, this kind of stuff is what you get when you have a world of offshore where there's no responsibility, no ability to really make sure that property is someone's property, that it's properly put to use, that it follows the rules. We've got a real problem. 
But then we went from that disclosure to a series of other disclosures. Thousands of people who had hidden accounts of UBS. Uh, and this was a result of an IRS undertaking uh, to get the names of Americans who had hidden money offshore. Because it was IRS and because it was only Americans, we can only guess at how much money came from other countries and particularly developing countries uh, to be shed in Switzerland uh, in a situation where, again, nobody would know it was there and nobody would know where it came from or how it was obtained. From UBS, the next disclosure was the so called LuxLeaks where there were disclosures about how corporations were being set up through Luxembourg in a way that completely enabled them to avoid tax in Europe and the United States and around the world. We move then on to the Panama Papers and a wonderful movie starring Meryl Streep called Laundromat, where uh, you can see a woman who purports to be the uh, managing director of the several thousand corporations running down the street to avoid the camera. Uh, it, it is beyond preposterous. They set up thousands of shell companies, and they had a woman who didn't know what the companies were, who presumed to be their chief executive. Good luck. Again, all set up by people who wanted to avoid the responsibility of being in a society where if they do something wrong or they have to pay tax, they'll escape. Things really began to be clear in that case because there were numbers of officials, government officials, who were coming out of the third world and who had stolen large amounts of money from their own countries and figured this was a pretty good way of hiding the money. But the disclosures kept coming. We had the uh, Paradise Papers. This was Bermuda. And again, corporations figuring out how to reach what uh, Senator Levin at one point called the holy grail of tax planning, pay tax nowhere. And Bermuda had that worked out to a fair degree. Uh, then we move on the most uh, recent sets of disclosures, the Luanda papers. This was uh, Angola and the ruling family in Angola, uh, purportedly a democracy, but not hardly, uh, kept its money in a way and passed the money on to the daughter of the then president through a series of uh, corporations that took essentially all of the great oil revenues of the country and moved them offshore to uh, Europe and uh, to be invested for profit by the daughter of the president. Now, it would be one thing if Angola were a country that was prospering because there was oil and uh, this money was being used to take care of the people of Angola. But if you look at the standards uh, that are set in, in terms of human development and the markers of what a society offers its people, Angola was near dead bottom worldwide with horrible figures on infant mortality, horrible figures on uh, death rates and mortality from different diseases. It's, you know, no running water, no no sewage systems, no anything, except for the one city of Rwanda where the cost of living was higher than the cost of living in Paris. And uh, I was at a meeting of uh, prosecutors from Africa and the Pacific region and uh, <coughs> met a young woman who was uh, a prosecutor in Angola. And she was regaling me with what a wonderful place Angola had become. And she was dressed in Paris fashions. I mean, really well-dressed and well-turned out and well-spoken, clearly a woman of considerable means. 
but her entire presence and her role as a prosecutor underscored to me how incredible the disparity between wealth and poverty in that country had become and how a system had become entrenched to move that wealth out of the country for the benefit of a very few people. And I think that she had things that she might have prosecuted that weren't being prosecuted, which in part explains her prosperity. But that's, that's only one of the many examples of uh, characters around the world who use this system uh, to loot their countries. And uh, we've had far too many looted countries. It's happened in Latin America again and again. It's happened, uh, well, uh, another example of uh, looting a country, Brazil. And uh, there we've had uh, a terrible series of scandals about the amounts of money that were paid by the Odebrecht engineering company uh, to get jobs around the world. And Odebrecht uh, first and foremost looted its own country, Brazil, by overcharging and uh, getting very favorable arrangements with the offshore oil sector in Brazil and in the construction of the Olympic Stadium and all of the other things that went with it. All of these things have become public. And the question I pose is, where is the action against this offshore system? At what point do people be, at what point are people to be held responsible for what they're doing? And at what point do we say enough is enough? We will not recognize uh, companies that don't have real boards of directors. We will not deal or allow our people to deal with companies whose beneficial ownership is secret. Uh, we will not accept the proposition that it's okay for Russians to put money into British elections and to use London as a place to invest in real estate and God knows what else uh, without questioning where the money came from or whose money it was. And particularly without questioning, well, what's going on in Russia? How are the average people benefiting or not from all of this uh, money that's turning up in London. One suspects the average Russian is not benefiting. And we can see that when people begin to raise those questions and ask, you know, what's really going on here? Uh, they wind up targets of poisoning and uh, whatever else Mr. Putin decides to do to them. And this is a country where Mr. Putin's violinist friend is alleged to have made $2 billion somehow magically that he has offshore. Uh, one suspects it's not all his money and that some of this is, uh, in fact, for the benefit of uh, Vladimir Putin. Of course, that's a detail we don't really need to go into to understand what's wrong with the system and what has to be changed. Now, I will say that within the last few days, we've had uh, indications that the administration, or the Biden administration understands the seriousness of the issue and seems to be prepared to begin to take action. But this is not gonna be an easy business and it's gonna take a long time to, to sort out. We've been wrestling with this for at least 35, 40 years and have some understanding of how it has operated and how the money has filtered up to the top, leaving a whole lot of people at the bottom in terrible trouble. Uh, there is an argument, and, and this I, I'm not here going to comment on the human rights aspect of it, but China has been uh, a place where a lot of the same sort of thing has happened. 
And there are things going on in the Chinese economy that are really almost scary. This business of the property investment and the debt racked up by property companies and the monies that the people who own those companies have made. Uh, what's happened to that money? And then how is this whole system of piled up debt going to be dealt with? It's a huge problem for the Chinese government. And I think the government is cracking down on a lot of it. The question is, can it be done without totally destroying the human rights of the people involved? Because we do understand that you can't solve this problem by simply saying, well, you're a bad guy, we're putting you up against the wall and shooting you. There has to be some kind of honest due process and analysis. So, so that further complicates uh, the notion of simple solutions. But we have to begin to deal with this set of problems. And I'm looking at it from the point of view of equality. Uh, I'm looking at it from the point of view of uh, developing a society that has a certain degree of justice to it, where people are able to get the goods and services that they are entitled to if their government worked and the money wasn't being stolen. I am looking at it from the point of view of the wives whose husbands say, oh, I'm broke and the money's all offshore. Uh, and uh, entangled in all of this are all sorts of crooks and criminals and, and people like Thoughtliner who sort of disappear with the money. But this is a world that's fixated on money and not on um, responsibility to the society people live in, not on um, what can I do, to use the words of John Kennedy, do for my country instead of what my country can do for me. Uh, how do we get that notion of I'm in this to maximize the box and get out of here without anybody catching? We've got to change that ethic, got to change the way that works. I've gone on about this for a bit. I, what I'd like to do is open it up to questions. Uh, if you have questions, and uh, we'll take it from there. Anybody? Well, I have a small audience, but please. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I know that you had a long career in fighting like corrupt, corruption and everything. What, what do you think is a uh, most important thing, the thing that you're most proud of that you, you've done uh, to oh. help fight corruption and uh, also like, I guess, with uh, tax evasion. Well, the biggest, the biggest corruption case that uh, I was ever involved in uh, was uh, Lockheed Aircraft's uh, overseas products. Lockheed Aircraft uh, hired a Japanese war criminal, a guy who had been in charge of fencing all of the things that had been stolen by the Japanese army in Japan in World War II. Uh, and he was their agent. And he paid uh, prime, then Prime Minister Tanaka uh, a couple of hundred million in Japanese yen in cash uh, to get the Japanese to buy the then Lockheed L-1011 airplane. Uh, it took 10 years, but Tanaka actually went to jail. And that was uh, called in Japan, the shock, the great shock. The society couldn't believe it because it's a very rigid, structured society. Everybody you know, goes along with the boss this was one time when the whole thing broke open and people began to realize, well, gee, the boss, the boss has really done something wrong and we have to do something to, to change that. Now, I'm not arguing that that permanently changed the way the Japanese do business. I will say, though, that it provided a totally new approach for a whole generation of younger 
Japanese politicians who began to be able to ask the questions and do what they had to do. Uh, there have been some other things that uh, I've been involved in that have focused on uh, this kind of uh, uh, problem, the bribery problems. I've been involved in, in Africa, particularly uh, looking into the monies that disappeared in the case of Sonny Abacha in Nigeria. Uh, Sonny Abacha uh, died and left behind a legacy of a missing six or so billion dollars. Uh, we learned later as the case moved on that what Abacha would do would be simply pick up the phone, call the Nigerian Central Bank, and say transfer X millions from the uh, state accounts of the central bank to my account in London, you know, or my account in Liechtenstein, or my account in Switzerland. Uh, that case has taken forever to resolve, and of the six billion, probably two has been recovered. And that goes down as one of the most remarkable and successful efforts at recovery in this business. Uh, the problem with the efforts to recover the money is that it is very expensive and takes too long because we now have to go fight these different jurisdictions, each one having a different claim and needing different lawyers and different people to fight the fight. So to give you an example of how crazy the Abacha recovery became, uh, there was a trail that led to Liechtenstein, a country that, as you may gather, I'm not terribly enamored of. I called the ruler, who's an absolute monarch, a crook, and uh, he tried to say some not nice things about me, but that's all fine. Uh, what was going on was there were a number of corporations that were set up in Liechtenstein that had the money. And it was clear because the record showed the money had been transferred to these corporations. So the question I asked when I went to talk to their chief anti money laundering person was, well, why can't you give the money back to the Nigerians? And the answer I got was, well, uh, under our law, you're required to have a proven criminal conviction that leads to the predicate offense for money laundering. And if you've got that conviction and can show the relationship of the money to the crime, we'll give the money back. So the question I then asked was, well, you understand that under the common law system, there couldn't have been a criminal conviction because Sonny Abacha died. And when you die under the common law system, end of the case, you can't sue or arrest or prosecute a dead person. So why are you guys hanging on to the money? And the answer, of course, was that each of those Liechtenstein entities was represented by a Liechtenstein lawyer. And every time the case went to court, yes, you earned legal fees. So this, this is part of the story of the complexity of, of these issues. Uh, similarly, I got involved in the case of uh, uh, the Philippines and uh, Marcos. And here I had a client who had records that showed where Marcos had sent money. <clears throat> and the client said to me, all I want out of this is a reward of 5% of whatever the government collects after all the legal fees. If you give me 5% of what you collect, I'll turn over the records. So I flew to Manila. I met with the people in Manila who were supposedly in charge of recovering the money. Uh, the meetings appeared to go pretty well. Uh, yeah, we're interested. Why don't you, well, we'll talk to our people and get back to you, go to your hotel, we'll call you in a couple of days and you know, rearrange and see what can be done. So I wait for the telephone call. I go back to meet with them and they say, well, it's a deal, but only on one condition. 
You take the case on contingent fee. I said, you're mad. Uh, I am a, a, essentially a sole practitioner. I was at a very small law firm. But the cost of retaining lawyers in four or five separate jurisdictions, of trying then to prove the provenance of the money, and then actually get a court judgment, those jurisdictions enabling me to take the money, would have bankrupted me, and they knew it. So the fact that they weren't willing to put forward a gun to go after the about 600 million that my client's records had told me there was zero interest in recovering the money. That is another part of that problem. Uh, when I was working for the UN, I uh, proposed putting together an international system of civil uh, law, civil law lawyers uh, who were on the civil side, not the criminal side, to go after money that had been stolen. Because my thesis was that you cannot permit dictators and plutocrats and autocrats to keep the proceeds that they've stolen. So this notion that had gone on in American diplomacy for a while, which is you were on our side during the Cold War, ergo you were a good guy, ergo we let you steal whatever you wanted, but gee, times have changed and we really would like to have the country go democratic. So why don't you just retire and we'll let you take your money and your toys and go off into a happy retirement. And we did that with quite a few uh, folks, including Baby Doc Duvalier, uh, uh, the uh, late Idi Amin uh, from Uganda, who spent his retirement in Saudi Arabia. There, there are just a number of retirees who got told, don't worry, nobody will get your bucks. Uh, my thesis is the way you keep the next guy from stealing whatever he can as a head of state is to go after the money of the last guy who stole them. And uh, I wasn't able to get anywhere with that for a whole series of reasons, um, most of which were, I thought, pretty ridiculous. But it's a whole other subject I could spend probably another hour on. That was a long-winded answer to a, a short question. Yeah. Jack, first, I want to thank you for coming to IGL today and uh, making such a, an interesting presentation. It's always a pleasure to have you join us. Um, I guess a few comments that, that I have that uh, I'm curious about. One, with, with the advancement of technology today, it would appear to me that um, the, the the, uh, the identification, the tracking, and the, uh, um, the pursuit of these types of criminal activities would be easier to accomplish. Do you have any comment on that as one question? And also somewhat related to it, um, when I was uh, reading uh, um, Shay's book, it, 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 it dawned on me, you know, just this issue of Bitcoin today, you know, and I'm wondering what your comments are as it relates to uh, Bitcoin. The two are somewhat, you know, related in terms of uh, these, the, these two issues. The first question, that is, uh, can't we track the money? Well, it turns out that in fact, uh, as a result of these disclosures and whistleblowers, we have tracked a lot of this money. And uh, thank you, its destination, its origin has been on the front page of the Washington Post, the Guardian, the New York Times. We've been around the block with this. The point is that not much has changed. The point is that when uh, the Panama Papers were disclosed, it took the IRS four years to bring the first case against people who had been disclosed in the Panama Papers. There were all sorts of hurdles. There were hurdles of trying to get information through the government of Panama, through 
non-working mutual legal assistance treaties, uh, all sorts of roadblocks, institutional troubles of one kind or another, internal, external, budgetary considerations, not having people, prosecutors and civil lawyers trained in how to do this, uh, all of that conspires so that even if there's disclosure, given the way the structure is set up, it's so difficult to maneuver through, you never quite get there. And as a result, uh, what we get is a kind of rear guard action when and if there's been this big disclosure of just how bad it was. So now there's a beginning of an effort to get back some of the money that was taken out of Angola. Uh, I hope I live long enough to see a result. This is, this is the kind of serious business, and it goes into the structure of the global legal system. It goes, if, if, if there is such a thing as a system, uh, it goes into the will of governments to take it on. Uh, multiple political considerations suddenly show up. And then it's just plain corruption in the countries where there is some responsibility and there is something resembling a legal system. So, for example, I was just recently in the UK where it turns out that a conservative member of parliament was acting as a lobbyist for the British Virgin Islands, a notorious tax haven. At the same time, he was a member of parliament. And the parliamentary uh, ethics uh, organization said he had violated the rules. And Boris Johnson came in and told the party, hey, let's back this guy up. And they said, well, the investigation wasn't fair. Oh, excuse me. Now, why is that going on? Well, in the UK, there is a concierge whose job it is to find ultra-rich people and persuade them to invest in London real estate, invest in, in London, period. Uh, the, the British government has turned itself inside out to welcome big money from outside. The largest single contributors to the Conservative Party, the largest single contributor, uh, a couple from Russia who have purchased residents in the UK, which you can do, and once you've done that, you can contribute to political parties. So guess what? They contributed, largest contributors to the conservatives. How does one overcome that piece of this corrupt system? So it turns out the, the problems on all sides, and it's a multifaceted problem, and one that we're going to have to come to grips with, because the consequences those people in the, in the mud in Angola, uh, the people in, in uh, Equatorial Guinea, uh, these are all human beings who deserve something better than to have their wealth, their natural resources, and everything else stolen from them and put to the benefit of a very small group. So, well, Anything more, and if not, yes. Well, on the inequality issue, which I think is also uh, the primary theme of, of this uh, event, uh, and everything you talked about touches on inequality in a big way, but there's a lot of excitement right now, and there's a picketing book which everybody has picked up on. Uh, but do those statistics include all this money offshore? In terms of uh, that or well, government statistics, you see, which people are already excited about, or is the offshore money missing from the statistics, and therefore the inequality worse? And it's, and it's so, what is how much of, of that is out there missing if it is missing? Well, the, the answer is the money isn't really missing. The offshore money, it turns out, is either in New York or London. Uh, in, in a nice bank account, but in the name of an offshore bank, an offshore corporation, or whatever. Nominally, uh, 
coming from whatever the country is that the money uh, seems to be belonging to. The real information about what's going on in this international arena is held by the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. The Bank for International Settlements is a banker's central bank, and it collects in great detail information from every country about capital movements and, and uh, the numbers that we would really need to complete the picture. Uh, I dare say that you could get America's nuclear secrets or the secrets of the latest Russian submarine more easily than you'd ever get the numbers out of the uh, Bank for International Settlements on how much money is in this offshore system. And I think one of the great pressure points and one of the things that has been least uh, explored is forcing that issue. Uh, making the U.S. Federal Reserve put the uh, heat on the Bank for International Settlements to release the information so we can all see just how bad this is and how concentrated that wealth is. So with that, thank you all for your attention. Uh, and uh, to those of you on camera, I'm sorry we couldn't have more of a conversation. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you.